at a lavish royal banquet taking place in late May of 1357. Edward III of England was accompanied by two of the most prestigious dinner guests in medieval history. On one side of him sat the captured King of Scotland, David II, and on the other was France's Valois King, Jean II. These priceless hostages were being displayed purposefully as an indicator of just how far the English kingdom of only around 4 million people had come. It had defeated the flower of medieval Europe twice and was now in a position to win the war. Though chaos reigned in the now kingless France, and Edward III believed his complete victory to only be a matter of time, the old land of Charlemagne would start to recover under the capable rule of Charles V. Welcome to our video on the Caroline phase of the Hundred Years' War. And if you're looking for more documentaries to watch, the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV, has a great offer for you. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries on a variety of topics, including science, true crime, nature, art and culture, and most importantly of all, historical titles. Want to learn more about the Hundred Years' War? A full feature documentary on Joan of Arc is perfect for you, while Elizabeth I, The War on Terror is an excellent choice for fans of English history. You can watch both anytime, anywhere, on your television, laptop or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. Our viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month. There are now more than 3,000 documentaries on Magellan TV, and every one of them is awesome. This offer is available to returning users too. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. Support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. Start your free trial today. Don't forget that this promotion supports our channel. When the Black Prince removed his Royal Valois prisoner from France, he also removed the anchor which kept the ship of state afloat. As military historian John Corrigan stated in his book A Great and Glorious Adventure, France was effectively in a state of civil war. The three years following Poitiers were some of the worst in French history. Rabid discontent with the government spread like a plague among the nobility, and Paris's third estate even asserted its authority under the leadership of Etienne Marcel, a cloth merchant. This wasn't the end of it. Demobilized soldiers, deserters and common bandits from England, Gascony, France and even further afield went renegade and formed so-called routiers or free companies. These bands of armed men roamed and ravaged the lawless countryside almost at will, serving any who would pay them and sometimes even setting themselves up as robber barons in their own right. They would remain a problem for decades to come. Even in lands where feudal control was maintained, it didn't do France any good. Extortionate ransom payments paid to the English for the swath of high-born prisoners taken at Poitiers prompted a ruthless tax hike, and this finally inflamed the peasants into a revolt. A horrific bloodletting, known as the Jacquerie, began in the Oise Valley, with peasants lynching and murdering any noble they could get their hands on. The uprising lasted for weeks, before Charles of Navarre brutally put it down. Threatened by another large assault by Edward III, the beleaguered Dauphin signed the Treaty of Brittany in October 1360, giving the Plantagenets all of Aquitaine, Ponthieu and Calais in return for the English king's renunciation of his own claim to the French throne, in addition to a £600,000 ransom for Jean's return. When two-thirds of the ransom had been paid, Jean II was allowed to return to France. However, one of his imprisoned sons escaped contrary to the agreement, which prompted the French king to voluntarily return to Edward's captivity in exchange for the younger Valois. He finally died there in 1364 and was succeeded as king by Charles V, whose accession was accompanied by a defeat in Brittany at Auray which ended the succession war there. To deal with the rampaging Rotier and secure Castile as an ally in one move, the new king gathered a large force of Rotier under a Breton called Bertrand de Guéclin and sent them to install a friendly contender on the Castilian throne in 1365, Henry of Trastamara. 
the deposed king, Pedro the Cruel, went to the Black Prince, who was now Duke of Aquitaine, for help. Realizing the strategic benefit of having a friendly monarch in Castile, the French gathered an army and marched against Henry, defeating him at Najera in 1367 and putting Pedro back on the throne. Unfortunately for him, this reign only lasted two more years before Henry assassinated his rival and took the crown once again. A Francophile was now firmly on Castile's throne. By the time Edward returned to Bordeaux in the late 1360s, he was growing ill from a disease contracted in Spain, and his direct rule in Aquitaine was creating discontent among long-time English subjects, not only the lands gained at Brittany. To pay for his military campaigns and the court of Bordeaux, Aquitaine's overlord had been imposing harsh taxes for years, but when he declared yet another fouage or hearth tax in 1368, some of the highest feudal lords in the realm revolted, petitioning Charles V for assistance. It was the chance he had been waiting for. Technically, Charles no longer had sovereignty over Aquitaine, but used a loophole in the Treaty of Bretigny as an excuse to receive the discontented nobles and again formally confiscate English possessions in France during late 1369. Despite attempted peace overtures by Edward III, Charles V was eager for revenge and the war was back on. The French attacked immediately, seizing the thinly defended counties of Ponthieu and Roregue with new tactics. Smaller, mobile contingents of soldiers replaced the large, massed armies which had been defeated at Crecy and Poitiers. Charles V also commanded that his generals refuse battle with the English, wary of suffering the bitter defeats of the 1340s and 1350s again. As Aquitaine's unwieldy new borders were being attacked, Edward III's son, John of Gaunt, launched a limited chevauchée in Normandy before withdrawing back to Calais not long after. In the following year, 1370, a notorious captain called Sir Robert Knowles was contracted to lead 4,000 troops to do the same thing. They set out on a devastating raid from Calais, and from there, devastated northern France before approaching Paris. Again, Charles V restrained his knights from meeting the English in open battle, and Knowles's band moved further into France. Realizing he needed a military leader with whom he saw eye to eye, France's Valois king made the pragmatic Breton Rottier, Captain Bertrand de Guerclin, a formidable guerrilla leader who had previously served in Castile, the new constable of France. This new commander quickly made a base at Caen and raised a force to meet Knowles's 4,000 before marching after the English. Errors in coordination and internal division among the raiding army resulted in disaster in early December 1370, when Guerclaw surprised and crushed it at the battles of Pont Velon and Var, destroying the Chavouchet before it could inflict any real damage on the king's reputation. In the south, French forces under Charles V's brother, the Duke of Anjou, continued the English disaster by capturing Agenais, Limousin and Bizec with many local lords defecting from their Plantagenet overlords and going over to the Valois. The now ailing Black Prince was livid about the treachery of his lords, and reacted violently when the Bishop of Limoges, his own son's godfather, betrayed the town to the French. He marched there, stormed into the city, and brutally sacked it against all chivalric conventions, supposedly not even sparing women and children who begged at his feet. Sickly and demoralized by the death of his eldest son, the Black Prince went home to England in 1371, a tired man, leaving John of Gaunt in charge of Aquitaine. After Poitou was wrenched away from the Plantagenet crown in 1372, Edward III realized more help was needed, and so he sent the Earl of Pembroke to Aquitaine with 160 soldiers in 20 ships three of which were larger, battle-worthy vessels with archery towers on them. As Pembroke was approaching La Rochelle Harbour at the height of a coastal inlet, however, he was confronted by a smaller fleet of Castilian combat galleys which were waiting for him to arrive. Castile's ships launched their attack first, 
and came into close quarters with the outnumbering but outmatched English, inflicting a few losses among the non-combat craft. Nevertheless, Pembroke's meagre number of archers managed to do their job incredibly well, laying down a precise rain of arrows on the Iberian ships. At the same time, his spear-wielding men-at-arms managed to bravely fight off boarding attempts by the enemy until dusk, when the fleets separated. Pembroke sailed slightly out to sea and set anchor, while the Castilians waited just off La Rochelle until dawn the next day. The English were nervous, they couldn't escape because the enemy galleys were faster than their own ships, nor could they pass through the treacherous shallow waters of La Rochelle at low tide. However, some Quetivon knights and their retinues did row out to join the English during the night. Pembroke kept his ships anchored, not expecting an enemy attack until high tide. However, the Castilian ships used their shallower draft and closed on the English while they were still immobile, spraying their decks and rigging with oil, before lighting the fuel with flaming arrows. This was the end of the battle in a complete victory for France's Iberian ally. Many of the English were burned alive, most of their ships were destroyed, and Pembroke himself was taken prisoner. English naval superiority, established at Sluis in 1340, met its end at La Rochelle, and a planned expedition by Edward III himself was cancelled. The next year, John of Gaunt led around 10,000 men out from Calais on the so-called Great Chevauchet, laying waste to a massive swath of land on his march all the way to Bordeaux. Nevertheless, the French did not engage the English in pitched battle, instead harassing John's vulnerable supply lines and picking off any stragglers or raiding columns which strayed too far. This effectively limited the damage, and even though the Chevauchet pulled Valois soldiers away from Aquitaine, by the close of 1373, almost all of the province was under French control. English territory in France had been reduced to its pre-war levels once again. Rather than covering each small-scale military action over the next decade, we'll cover the crucial dynastic politics which begins to affect the course of the war from this point on. In the June of both 1376 and 1377, England suffered a great loss. The bed-ridden Black Prince, formerly the great model of medieval chivalry, succumbed first, followed the year after by his legendary father, Edward III, who perished after a reign of half a century, widely viewed as a golden age for the Kingdom of England. His successor was Richard II, second son of the Black Prince. Since he was still a minor, however, true authority would be wielded by a regency council until the king came of age. Only days after Richard II's coronation, the boy king's realm was beset by a series of lightning ship-borne raids on its channel ports. From Rye in the east to Plymouth in the west, the French pirates, led by a talented knight and admiral called Jean de Vienne, used their dominance of the sea to viciously plunder and loot. France's political situation also changed when in mid-September 1380, Charles V the Wise, France's Valois monarch who had held his kingdom together in its darkest hour and doggedly led the reconquest of Aquitaine, died of an illness. He left the crown to the 11-year-old Charles VI, also a minor. This situation gave the king's four uncles, the so-called Princes of Blood, an opportunity to form a regency council as well the Dukes of Anjou, Berry, Bourbon, and Burgundy. The Duke of Burgundy, Philippe the Bold, was the younger son who was captured with Jean II at Poitiers in 1356, and his dynasty would bring Burgundy to power in the 15th century. Unfortunately for France, the Regency also gave the Dukes an opportunity to exploit their positions to gain more power, and they squandered the carefully maintained treasury of Charles V. The political situation had changed again in both kingdoms by the late 1380s, as both kings asserted their independent rule. In France, Charles VI embarked on a personal rule, dismissing the Valois magnates from his council in November of 1388, and replacing them with a group of his father's old advisers, known as the Marmosets. His rule started well, and the people began to call their king the Beloved, 
but on the other side of the English Channel, Richard II's reign descended into a tyranny throughout the last decade of the 14th century. While the king managed to forge a 28-year truce with the French, his internal problems began to get worse. This all came to a climax when John of Gaunt's son, Henry Bolingbroke, was cast out of England for 10 years as a political threat. The former didn't react to his son's exile, but when Gaunt died in 1399, and Richard II both extended his banishment to life and confiscated his vast Duchy of Lancaster, the Rubicon had been crossed. Henry Bolingbroke returned and landed at the Humber estuary in June, and almost immediately most of Richard's nobles deserted him, unnerved by the king's actions. Richard, who had travelled to Ireland to put down a rebellion there, was deposed and died a few months later in prison while the House of Lancaster became the Royal House of England when its usurping patriarch came to the throne as Henry IV. As the 15th century approached, it seemed as though internal strife in England and wise rule in France would set the tone for another generation. However, a single figure would turn that state of affairs on its head and reignite the English war effort, Henry V. Our story of the Hundred Years' War will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.